I'm Mary Hogan Prusi. I um, am a senior advisor to Fifth Wall, and I also um, sit on the board of four public companies. I'm the lead director of Kimco. I'm the chairman of the board of Digital Realty, and I'm on the board of Host Hotels and Realty Income. Um, in my previous life, I was an investor, and it is a huge privilege for me to um, moderate this panel, where I was a panelist often back in the day. Um, so I'd love to just introduce um, these amazing group of people I have with me. To my left is Jackie Brady. Jackie is the head of global debt solutions at PGM Private Alternatives, which is Prudential Investment Management. Um, Jackie and I also sit on the board of Realty Income together. Jackie and I have also sort of pursued a parallel life uh, professionally. We both were analysts right out of college, right around the same time. Both went to liberal arts colleges. Jackie yeah. went to Haverford, I went to Bowdoin, <laughs> both on the board of those schools and on the investment committee of those schools. But today we are all about NYU, so <laughs> no worries there. <laughs> uh, next up are Steve Buller, um, who barely needs an introduction. Steve is a portfolio manager at Fidelity Investments. He's been at this for 30, Year. 32 years. 32 yeah. years, um, and with an amazing track record. Um, one thing I've learned from Steve is um, not to be too wedded to management or an idea. He is very agnostic to all of that, um, and um, a, a really a, a terrific investor. Uh, next to him, Nick Joseph, head of the U.S. REIT and lodging team at Citi, produces terrific research, which I think a lot of us get. Um, some of us are obsessed with uh, his weekends, um, because he starts every weekend with what he did with his family, and I just I hope that um, Billy makes it to a REIT conference sooner than later. We'll get him here next uh, year. <laughs> Nick also talks to every single investor in the world that invests in real estate, so his perspective is amazing. Uh, next to him is Cedric Lachance. Cedric is the director of research at Green Street. I think that Green Street also needs no introduction. Um, you know, uh, in, in a way, uh, Cedric is maybe the yin to Steve's yang. When you think back to um, the early days of Green Street and the real discipline they enforced on our industry in terms of balance sheet, sector neutral um, investing, and now have evolved to um, just offer a terrific um, uh, uh, realm of products in the, real, in the real estate industry while still providing great research. Um, and then last but not least, Suzanne Sorkin. Uh, Susie's a senior vice president at Adelante Capital Management. Fun fact, uh, Adelante is the biggest and one of only two um, minority-owned uh, funds that, dedicate, that, that are dedicated to real estate. Um, fun fact number two is that we worked together for nine years, so I think that everything she's going to say is brilliant. Um, and one thing you might also not know about Susie, she was an accounting major, um, and it's much cooler than it sounds, because to sit in a room with Susie um, in her extremely polite demeanor and listen to her uh, question a CFO in, in such an incredibly detailed way, uh, it made me a better investor. So anyway, thanks for, um, thanks for having us. Um, so let's jump in. Um, first, we're going to talk about the current environment. Uh, you know, I think we were all hoping that 2024 would give us a more normal or at least an orderly trend of stabilized interest rates um, and some price discovery as the transaction market picked up. Um, that's not really what's happened. I mean, we've seen a pickup in deal volume, but we continue to field curveballs from the Fed, geopolitical um, stability, just like everyone's been saying all day, and uh, the relationships between commercial banks and commercial real estate remain top of mind for for, you know, for me. Um, so I wanted to kick off with, you know, how drastically has your investment strategy pivoted just in the shorter run as we manage these mixed signals from the Fed and inflation data? Um, you know, uh, are, you, are you applying lessons of history here? And I thought maybe Steve could, could leave us off. Um, yeah. I'm a firm believer that over long periods of time, the returns, and there's no magic to this, um, in the REIT market are roughly half fundamentals and half capital and capital is interest rates. Unfortunately, we're now held captive to interest rates and we're going on almost two years where it seems to be 95% plus, the returns are all about interest rates and that cost of capital, access to capital, cost of capital, your ability to exploit that capital. I was hoping that we'd start to push back on that and go back to that historical average and I'm Losing a little bit of faith of that due to the volatility, and I don't mean the fact that interest rates are going up again, but the volatility, the lack of stabilization of interest rates, whether short or long term, whereby the market, whether it's the direct real estate market or the public real estate market, can ascertain what the prices should be. Um, 
going to have I changed my strategy? I'm a long-term investor. My turnover is 20 to 30% over long periods of time. So I'm not changed my philosophy or strategy, but I do have a slide in my standard marketing deck that I called emphasis on positioning. That is, what do you see the characteristics of the sectors or stocks that I own today? And I'm a wimp. I'm a, I have no freaking conviction. I have this darn balanced approach between risk on and risk off, growth versus value, however you want to term it, and I hate that. And some days, and as a portfolio manager lately, you feel like you're the smartest person, and the next day, whoop, you're an idiot once again. <laughs> and that's the market we live in, and I wish we, going back to tie this all together, where we can go back to that fundamentals that matter more than the capital side of the business. Right. Oh, no, I know, even just last week, right, with the, the air deal, we all thought, oh, this is our time, we get it, and then three days later, it's like, Never mind. Um, <laughs> Susie, anything to add to that? Well, I think, I mean, as you mentioned, I think that when we entered the year, we were hoping for more stability, and we got the opposite. I mean, the market started with, you know, expecting six cuts, and now we're down to two. So there's been just a huge, zero. 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 <laughs> I mean, after yesterday. So, I mean, you know, we've seen a huge pivot, and I think we've seen a tremendous amount of volatility. Um, you know, while REITs get a bad rap for their volatility relative to private, as an active long-only manager, we're trying to use use that volatility to actually create alpha. And so while we haven't, you know, just like Steve said, we haven't changed our overall investment strategy. We're really, you know, trying to take a long view. We really like to think of ourselves as partners to REITs. You know, even though it's a public investment, we kind of treat it almost as a private investment. We're really trying to use the volatility to lean into positions that we like. And so we're going after companies that have secular growth tailwinds that kind of can outrun this inflation and outrun um, you know, the headwinds from refinancing. Um, and then also, of course, have strong and flexible balance sheets that can take advantage over time. I mean, we have, you know, as Steve talked about, sort of risk on, risk off, and value versus growth. We have shortened up the duration of our portfolio a little bit for the time being. Um, and then I think all the, re the recent M&A from Blackstone with Tricon and Air, I mean, it's definitely caused us to reevaluate some of our positions and think about those companies that are trading at historically wide discounts. Um, I think M&A, you know, can't be the sole factor for owning a company, but it's definitely causing us to dust off, you know, some old models. Yeah, right. Yeah, we're going to dig a little bit more into M&A later, too, but I agree with you. Um, Jackie, what a time to be doing what you're doing, um, providing debt capital and allocating in a pretty unprecedented time for most of us. Um, how are you feeling about things? Well, I, I was expecting to be feeling better. <laughs> Debt's actually having a moment, but um, nobody wants to borrow long at these widespreads, right? It's, it's normally a time in the market where we've been waiting for, um, you know, for capital to pull back in some ways. You know, what we do is, as a debt investor, it, you know, the commodity product is money. And so we've been waiting for lenders to retrench for one reason or another, for the markets to kind of create an opening where it would be um, really attractive. And, and for the most part, as we saw definitely last year, fundamentals held up well, rates were rising, spreads were wide, back up the truck, right. except <laughs> the flaw in our logic was the, you know, the kind of paucity of transactions and the lack of borrowers who really wanted to go, to go long and wide. So it is, it is an, an interesting time for debt. We've had you know, several periods along the cycle of debt where debt has been interesting, particularly to, interest, you know, to equity investors. It isn't often. Normally, they kind of leave us alone. We kind of do our own thing. It's a little bit boring. You know, students come out, and they all want to be equity investors, and nobody wants to pay attention to debt. I know that's what you're saying out there. <laughs> but, but there are a few times where you can either buy non-performing or you know, kind of really lean into distress, which makes the, the debt analysis pretty interesting. And this looked like it was going to be a time where just originating straight up, you know, kind of uh, standard senior debt also would have had um, really attractive return profiles. But now we're finding that public fixed income has, you know, bonds are back, as people are saying, right? Public fixed income has a, a really competitive uh, angle, and senior debt spreads are wide and less utility than I would have liked. So 
It's, it's uh, you know, we'll get, I know, later into some thoughts around um, what is happening on the str more stress side of, of the market, where we are, we are definitely seeing that. It doesn't look like it has in the past. Um, it's definitely, I know I was talking to students at my table a little while ago, it's definitely not a pretend and extend. It is not a kick the can. I'm very, you know, I have kicked cans. This is not a can kicking market, right? This is a market which, which is uh, not getting bailed out by a lower rate environment. So every piece of debt that is rolling costs you more. It costs you more to, to meet your debt yield test and pay it down. It costs you more to buy rate protection to get that extension. So along the way, this is, this is much more of a capital infusion market for managing debt. Um, and that will create opportunity as well. But in terms of what a, a, the view from you know, on high would look like, widespreads, fewer lenders, you, know, you have capital, we should be happier. <laughs> I don't know, Robin, this is, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing the bottom. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. feeling it. This is, signs are pointing the right direction. I'm feeling, feeling excited. Um, Nick, I wanted to check in with you. How has your perspective changed on um, opportunity versus risk um, and the companies that you're recommending? Um, you know, I, I know there's opportunity in here somewhere. And like, I didn't have just when I think I know where it is, I don't. And I was just wondering your thoughts on that. Absolutely. Um, there absolutely are opportunities out there, I think. If you think, we, we've been talking about REITs on average, right? And the REIT index is down this year, and obviously it's been very uh, impacted by what's happened on the rate side. But I think if you look at the underlying individual securities, there's actually a pretty wide range of returns. And so we went back to 2000, we looked at the top quartile of REITs in any individual year versus the bottom quartile. That difference is about 50 percentage points on average. And in many years where there's more stress, it's actually even higher. So there are always opportunities. The, the challenge is always figuring out where those opportunities are. Sometimes it is property sector, sometimes it's geography, sometimes it's balance sheet, uh, but we're absolutely um, kind of seeing some opportunities uh, within the real estate space right now. Steve touched on interest rates. Obviously the volatility is really hurt. Clearly, if we had less volatile rates, that would be good. On an absolute level, lower rates would be good. I think the other challenge right now is some of the larger sectors uh, that we think have very good medium and longer term tailwinds, industrial, residential, um, storage, all of those are seeing a deceleration in fundamentals right now. Some of those are supply driven, some of those are housing driven, um, but I think it's been a combination of higher rates and decelerating growth that just hasn't attracted generalist investors recently. Uh, if we look forward, the supply picture is starting to improve for some of those sectors. We think industrial probably turns the soonest. Uh, we think apartments start to turn uh, probably sometime next year, particularly in the Sun Belt. Um, life science sometime next year as well. And so we think, you know, right now we're trading at a discount. There's opportunities for that second derivative to start to turn. And so where we're most positioned right now, we like residential, uh, particularly single family rentals. Uh, we like healthcare, particularly senior housing, um, and we do like industrial, um, uh, maybe absent the report we got this morning of maybe a bit more deceleration than we were expecting. Thanks. Uh, Cedric, how does that line up with, with your thinking? Yeah. Um, so I was told earlier that we need to disagree with each other. <laughs> yeah. It's better like that, so I'll, I'll just do that. Um, so I, I, um, I'm a historian by trade, so you're going to have to humor me for a couple of minutes. And I didn't stay a historian because I saw the paycheck and I figured I'm going to learn Excel and it's going to be a little <laughs> bit better. Um, when, when you look at real estate, it really became part of the capital markets over the last 30 years. And in doing so, started tying itself, of course, to the rate environment more and more than ever. When you look at the last few years, there is a virtually perfect correlation between what happens to REITs in the public market and changes in interest rates. And I'm talking about mid to long-term interest rates. That correlation prices in immediately in the public market. So playing the rate game is useless. That's not where we need to spend our time. Where we need to spend our time is to figure out within a certain rate environment, and in this case, a 5% rate environment, and the sooner we all accept that, the better we're gonna be. In a 5% rate environment, what is available, what is better to do? And that's, you, you asked at the beginning, what have we changed in our mentality? What have we changed? To us, very little. We're, we're being reinforced in what we believe. The REITs are now 
positioned in a way where they can take advantage to some extent of what will occur in the private market, especially in office, potentially uh, in the apartment business as well, and you see the occasional distress in other sectors. The, the REITs are positioned in that way because in 2008, none of them were positioned in that way. Balance sheets were not uh, in a way, uh, it, were not positioned so that they could take advantage of distress. REITs were the distressed parties. So what we're seeing today is REITs have an incredible cost of debt advantage. That's what Jackie referred to. She'd love to lend, but her lending spreads are way in excess of what REITs can get in the unsecured bond market. That's the advantage of being part of the bond market, but it's the advantage of having tied to the rate environment as well. So, so REITs have a cost of debt advantage. What they don't have yet often is a cost of equity advantage. So a lot of REITs still unfortunately trade at a discount to NAV. And as a result, we're not quite in a position where REITs can fully take advantage of what will be available out there. From a sector positioning perspective, we're very much focused on the value of the real estate and a little bit with the growth. I heard a lot about growth this morning, and all I hear about growth is external growth, and people forget to think about internal growth. What can your portfolio generate? It is likely to be the greatest source of growth, actually, for most companies. Uh, in the real estate space. So from our perspective, the non-traditional property sectors are still by far the most interesting sectors in the public market. And there is they're, one- They're, they're th traditional now. <laughs> they're, they're all traditional, <laughs> perhaps, yeah. Um, it's traditional to be non-traditional. Uh, so, so if you think about data centers, obviously, gaming, uh, manufactured homes, which uh, are, are all sectors that very much institutionalized. Are, these are all sectors we find very interesting. Uh, there are elements of the healthcare business that we find very interesting as well. And then I'll give you a sleeper pick. Um, so when we think about how sectors are ranked, one sector that looks middle of the pack is strip centers. Strip centers is within what looks about average today the most likely to outperform over time because you've had no supply for a decade. There will be no supply for the next several years. Tenants are uh, eager to be in the quality space the REITs offer, and replacement costs are so much above, or the rents needed for replacement, so far above the rents that are being charged on the real estate today, that there will be significant pricing power coming to the strip center business over time. So instead of chasing yesterday's news, um, take the sectors that have struggled, that are still considered a little bit beaten down, and I think strip centers could be a sleeper pick. Thanks, anybody want to comment on Cedric's comment before I get to the next thing? Um, Jackie, what about you? Any, uh, do you? When you look at sectors um, in lending and, uh, and originating, how do you think about this so, discussion? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think very uh, dissimilar. We think there are, um, you know, supply challenges in certain sectors and markets. But if I think long term, we we like multi. We like the living sectors generally, right across the across the spectrum. We are so chronically undersupplied in housing. I think I heard it on the last panel. So there's quite a bit of opportunity there. We like um, the nearshoring effect that will, that will impact industrial. We, we think we're not talking a lot about geopolitics here today and you know, kind of goods moving through the Suez Canal, et cetera. But we, are, you know, we, like, we can see a, a path for industrial that we like. Data centers, I, I completely agree with you that the alternatives as a whole have now become a sector, right? And so um, we have been active in data centers as well as senior housing. So I don't think there's much difference between the public and private market appetite there from what I see. Super, thanks. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, moving into um, a section I like to call REIT 2.0. Um, it's in building on the conversation um, that we just sort of concluded. Um, you know, obviously, uh, when you think about the future in the context of the current market, you know, so much has changed since 1991, which was where many people point to the beginning of the modern REIT era. Um, you know, back then, the opportunity to leverage between public and private valuations was amazing. It was fun. Um, and, um, uh, but when, when REITs became their own separate industry sector in 2016, which I was really supportive of and feel bad now a little bit, um, you know, a lot changed. Uh, you know, our, this, the, the REIT sector is the third smallest asset class in the S&P. Um, you know, somebody earlier was talking about how much bigger the industry that, you know, the, the, we've gotten in terms of the benchmark but we've been eclipsed by, by everything else, even though our earnings this year don't look that bad relative to... N to NVIDIA, its market cap is bigger than the <laughs> global listed REIT sector. Exactly, exactly. Um, and we've lagged the market for 
a while, um, you know, and 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 even in the S and P, you know, we're dominated. Uh, our benchmark is dominated by companies. Many of them are their their business is quite divergent from the buying and selling of core real estate. Um, and so, what I want to get into is like, what is the market telling us? And you know, how can our industry deliver earnings growth, liquidity, and yield to make REIT stocks more of a first look for all investors? I mean, when you think about what we've all just been saying so far, I mean, if we feel, I feel like the public market is the solution to the problem, um, and I just don't know how to get investors in. Um, but one thing I wanted to talk about is, is REIT leverage, and starting, you know, starting with Jackie. Leverage has tripped up so many REIT business models over time, as all the historians on the panel uh, would say. And so I was wondering how you feel about, um, about leverage levels in our, in our sector. Well, I am sure there are others here who can speak more eloquently to leverage in the sector specifically. But on the concept of leverage writ large, yeah. you know, my um, mother used to have a saying that I loved, which was, um, if the grass looks greener on the other side, it's because it's full of manure, or whatever word you want to substitute <laughs> for manure, right? And so generally speaking, um, it, private investors operate at higher levels of leverage. But also, they would love, they would relish the access to the unsecured bond market, like, you know, like you said, that, that REITs clearly, you know, clearly offer. And leverage itself is, is merely a tool. I mean, in, our, in, in the kind of lending that I do, we're effectively pricing a put option, right? They're generally non-recourse loans. We're kind of pricing the risk that you will hand me back the keys or in the case of callability and, and prepayments, pricing the risk that this, this wonderfully high spread loan will, will go away. And so in the REIT market, and I, you know, I'll turn it to the fellow panelists here who can comment, comment more specifically, there isn't a, that isn't a free lunch, right? The cost of that is going to have, or may potentially have, I'll hear, an implication for your, um, uh, ability to continue to access both the debt and equity markets, which is you know, not necessarily the way it operates in the private space, where even for core private funds, we operate at higher levels of leverage than REITs, and that's the kind of lower levered arm of the private real estate market. Obviously, uh, investors in value add or higher yielding strategies are taking on considerably more leverage risk, but commensurately getting you know, paid in return for that. So if I think about kind of core, um, you know, kind of income producing, uh, you know, the, that se a segment of the market, it's not entirely clear that, that to me, that you know, REITs amping up the leverage. This is a weird conversation to have now in this rate environment, <laughs> right? right? It's just weird. We should have been talking about this a couple of years ago in a different environment. But um, not entirely clear that there is, that, that is um, a, you know, kind of a, a uniformly positive outcome. But I'd be curious as to what others. I actually not worried about leverage, not worried. It's maturity schedule. Which companies are, when is the repricing of their current debt stack going to take place is probably more of an issue in the REIT market than the absolute level of leverage or debt. Yeah, and I also think it's fixed versus floating as well, right? So I think it's having a well ladder debt maturity, fixed rate debt. Um, you need to match your assets to your liabilities. So it really depends on kind of the nature of your business. If it's a short lease duration business, you probably need uh, less leverage. If it's longer, maybe you can support a bit more. We uh, looked across all the REITs. Right now, you're at about five times net debt to forward cash EBITDA. Long-term average is about five and a half times. On a debt to GAV basis, you're in the low 30s. It's about five percentage points below the long-term average. I would say there's some businesses that probably could support a little more leverage, um, but then there's also others that, uh, that obviously are maybe a bit over-levered relative to where they are. So it's hard to generalize. Um, when, uh, when everything was going well, we did hear from investors frequently, and you'd hear it to the companies as well, you know, why not have a little more leverage? It's cheap, you know, juice your returns a bit. I think right now the REITs are pretty happy with where their balance sheets are, at least relative to the private side. I'd be curious to get your take. Yeah, no, I would, I mean, I hate to, as you said, we need to disagree on this panel, but I would really agree with what everyone is saying. I mean, I think you have to look at the type of leverage, and I think, I mean, just even six months ago, we were thinking, you know, if rates were going to go down, everyone was just concerned about when, you know, as Steve mentioned, in terms of that maturity wall, and now we're looking at, okay, we need to think about the next three years, and then the level of fixed versus floating. 
So Mary, one thing I would add is in my, you know, in the private space, there's been a wall of maturities almost my entire career, right? Like it just, it just keeps going. We, we don't see it fall off a cliff. I mean, those of us who were around for the, um, the prior, prior to the GFC crisis, so like the RTC, I mean, there's always three letters. I don't know what this three letter <laughs> one is. But those of us remember it actually, like the wall actually collapsing, right? There's like sales into the market and you know, kind of you can kind of pick up your distress and reset. This has been a much more progressive, right? right? So it's, it's almost as though, um, the maturity date is a decision for a conversation in the private lending space. It, is, it, is, it doesn't have the same effect as rolling in the public bond market. So in some senses, one of the benefits that the private markets have offered is this kind of ability to serially manage um, you know, kind of a, a relatively consistent maturity wall uh, with pain, that doesn't, it's not a free option there either, but it doesn't have, you know, it doesn't have the same restrictive approach. Thanks. Um, that's a super interesting perspective. Um, uh, Susie, you know, I think that, uh, or one thing that we, uh, uh, I think Cedric and, and Nick were with me last year on this panel, and um, one of the things we were talking about is um, that a lot of companies seem to be just waiting too long for things to come back to, to normal. Um, and I think you've seen that actually this year in people waiting on transactions just to see where interest rates were going to go. Um, how do you, you know, I just wanted to know how, do you think staying the course works, like when you look out to the future? And, um, and, and then just like as a riff on that, um, you know, how important is core to your portfolio mix? And how do you, you know, how do you think about core versus everything else? Maybe I'll, if it's okay, I'll answer that question in reverse. We could talk about the core piece because I think it has implications for the question you're asking about sort of if, is the REIT model, you know, broken? And I think, spoiler alert, it's not broken. We can get to that in a second. <laughs> I think when you think about the core versus, I think it speaks a little bit to what we've been talking about in terms of the traditional versus non-traditional sectors. Um, and we really, you know, I think we're sort of in REIT. 3.0 is, you know, you talked about 2 but we're really in sort of another phase of the modern REIT era because over the last 15 to 20 years, we've kind of capitalized these newer niche asset classes like data centers and towers and lab space. Um, and we always say REITs house the economy. And so as the economy has evolved, you know, the REIT market has too. And so as an active manager in the space, we're trying to embrace those newer property types, which represent more than 40% of the indices today. Um, actually, back in 2018, Adelante, we launched two indices. One is called the Adelante Core Property Securities Index, and the other is called the Adelante Next Gen Index. And what we did was really put those sort of five food groups into the core, but in, you know, mirrors the Nate Creef Odyssey, but in a public format. And then the Next Gen really represents those newer niche asset classes. And by doing so, you could really dissect the property performance of the entire industry. Um, and you could really see that some of those newer asset classes were really enhancing returns over time. And if, if you look over the last one, three, five, and 10 years, um, and this is not my shameless plug for REIT, <laughs> but uh, the median REIT uh, manager has outperformed Nacreep Odyssey. And I think some of that return, we'd like to say that it's, you know, that we're better, uh, but it's really from embracing those newer property types. Um, and so I think then as a result, you know, people are providing, you know, REIT managers are providing um, completion strategies. And so you can even launch a portfolio of all of those newer niche asset types and pair it with someone, you know, an investor who may have core exposure, even in a private vehicle. And then they use the REITs um, as that completion piece. But maybe going back to the first part of your question, sorry to ramble. Um, in terms of like, is the REIT model broken? I don't think so. I mean, despite the underperformance, despite being, you know, one of the smallest GICs groups, I think the question really comes down to, is there a reason to be public? Is there a cost of capital advantage? And can REITs use that to grow? And I think we're in a market of haves and have nots, but I think the answer to all of those questions is firmly yes. Um, as we talked about with you know, access to capital on the debt side, it's tremendous. I mean, having access to the unsecured market, we saw the REITs, I think they issued more than 12 billion in the first quarter alone, especially they tapped it in January when we saw rates drop, and so that has been huge. And then, as Cedric talked about earlier, there is still a cost of equity if you look at sort of NAV premiums. It's, again, it's a world of haves and have nots. But there are a lot of sectors actually trading at premiums to NAV. I mean, you look at it, it's industrial, it's healthcare, it's even the malls. I don't think people would think that. Um, and, and of course, the data centers. 
Um, and so, you know, obviously, uh, Office is trading at a steep discount, and I think that's just the public markets, you know, cutting off capital to a sector that has challenges, and it really reminds me of kind of what we did with bricks and mortar retail 10 years ago, um, and then supply was slowly cut off there, the business evolved, you know, with e-commerce, and now we're talking about the resurgence of bricks and mortar today, so I think, you know, who knows what we're going to be talking about for Office in 10 years, so I think as long as the REITs kind of use their cost of capital advantage wisely, I'm still betting on REITs for the long term. Great. I hope everyone agrees with me. <laughs> <laughs> no disagreement. Um, okay, um, not to over talk about myself, but I sit, on, um, I sit on four boards and they all tend to be sort of like the category killers in their respective sectors. And by that yeah. I mean that they tend to be the biggest by a margin of the, um, relative to the size of the other companies. Um, I've always been a proponent that I think, you know, I think that, that bigger can work. I know that not everybody agrees with that. Um, and so uh, I maybe thought I would start with, uh, Cedric, with you. How do you think about size? Um, do you think that companies get too big to grow? Do you think, what do you think? Yeah. Um, there, there's a convoluted answer to your question, sim simply because there are a lot of reads where bigger has been better where um, perhaps from a, a um, global perspective, in spite of being bigger, growth is still available. Something about realty income, um, I, that's, that's not a shameless plug for the two of you guys, <laughs> but it's, it's worked, right? The ability to, to take advantage of size and scale. Uh, the, without a doubt, from a technological perspective, the ability to have a large asset base on which to spread Costs of innovation, uh, soon costs associated with AI, everything of that nature is a real benefit to larger companies. Uh, there is also clearly a benefit of scale when it comes to the GNA costs. So if you think about the, the management fee associated with uh, running a large portfolio of assets, we see that, we see that in numerous M&As where there, there's clearly efficiencies that are being harvested out of the system. So in, in many cases, you can have that outcome of bigger being better, and it makes sense for real estate companies uh, in the public market to, over time, uh, have that element of category killer. At the same time, there are a lot of players in the real estate space that uh, provide a significant service to investors by being focused on a certain area, by property sector, obviously. Uh, so you want to be focused by property sector, but by markets as well. And it allows investors to bet more directly on those elements and allows those companies to take advantage of that and be able to, to grow both internally and externally in a very positive manner. So, so the size answer, unfortunately, is it's, it depends, and it really depends how it's being used, how the cost of capital is being taken advantage of, and whether or not you're in a business where scale is really going to make a difference, right? I would argue an office scale ultimately didn't really make a difference. It's, it was not an advantage. In the net lease business, it is an advantage. In the storage business, it's an advantage. Uh, we've seen it in certain places where there's a real benefit to that. Um, I'm bracing for impact, but Steve. I'd yeah, Steve's going to disagree. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Let's hear your thoughts on bigger. Is bigger um, better? I'm not convinced always, and I think you see that at times in the share price performance that it, you know, are people getting bigger because it may be a defense against being taken over because size is a hindrance to that? I see that at times. Is getting bigger just to do deals and? If there's not accretion in deals, and it's very difficult, you could be making a long-term great real estate decision, but it would be short-term FFO per share dilutive, and that is a tough one. And I've seen deals that are supposed to be long-term accretive, where's the frickin' accretion? They, they just don't show up. And so I'm, I'm becoming more skeptical over time of this, of M&A, the M part of it and whether or not it fulfills the growth part of it because growth is what the equity markets want, whether we like that or not in the REIT space. It has proven over time why Office was 20% of my benchmark 20 years ago and the MSCI, it's 4%. Office doesn't matter from a benchmark perspective. It matters more to the regional banks in the public markets than it does to the public REIT market, as perverse as that sounds. Nick, what do you think? Hmm? I was, I was, I was going to ask Nick what he uh, thinks. Yeah, I, th I think you really do need a, 
a justification for the M part of it. I think the A part keeps um, keeps companies. Uh, I, I don't want to necessarily say honest, but there's there's a give and take between the public and private side, right? Public REITs own 10 to 15 percent of institutional quality real estate in the U.S. The remainder is private, right? So when you look at capital and when they look across opportunities on the private side, when they look at where the public REITs are trading, um, the acquisition side, and we've seen two privatizations thus far this year. Uh, provides that opportunity to close any NAV discount that may be there on the public side. So, so I'd put that aside. In terms of the M, um, to Steve's point, the synergies um, are sometimes realized, sometimes they're not. We usually uh, do see the GNA synergies. It's it's usually on the operating side that uh, that are more questioned. And ultimately, if you can drive the cash flow and there's a rationale for that merger. We think that makes sense. We do think on average, the larger REITs usually have the ability uh, to use their scale across more properties, usually are able to attract um, additional talent. And so we do think there are benefits, but it, you know, there's not a one size fits all for it. Thanks. Um, just to build upon that and going back to Steve, um, you know, another, um, you know, uh, obviously um, activism is um, a topic that is top of mind for I think you know all companies, all reboards, and, and, and all investors. Um, and I wanted to ask you, um, you know, from your perch, you've seen a lot over the over your career. Um, how do you feel about the leadership you're seeing in the industry these days? Um, what do you think should be top of mind for managements and, and REIT boards? Just in, uh, from a yeah, I, I mean, Mary being on four boards, statistically, chances are one's going to underperform that I may own. So I'm constantly emailing her, like, <laughs> sure. it's true. what and are I'm you like, doing? Which one is it today? Yes. Yes. Sure. Um, look, I, I jotted down a couple things here. Corporate governance only matters when you're not have when you don't have good absolute returns or you have horrid relative returns. Otherwise, when people are making money, generally speaking, the market could care less about corporate governance. It's a factual statement. Um, boards and management, they really don't understand the difference between alpha and beta. And I think they should be given finance 101 lesson. Because when REIT shares have been going up, they all think they're the smartest people in the room, even though they could be massively underperforming a REIT benchmark. Uh, next one I wrote was, um, just being public does not give you a perpetual right to be public forever, and hence why if you are underperforming, the board or management should be looking at other options. Um, activism is a good thing. I wish boards would quit spending lots of times with investment bankers and lawyers. I know I'm going to get in trouble here with some of the sponsors <laughs> in trying to prevent activists instead of maybe looking in the mirror to see what's the real problem. That to me is more important. My favorite Bloomberg function is MGMT. And then you go into the board, and you're constantly looking, hmm, who's on this board? Do I know any of them? What do I think of them? Who are these other people? Um, are, do they need this income to be on the board? Because then they may not have different vested interest in things. Um, the independent ba uh, board members, our corporate governance person says, independent board members that have been on a board for more than 10 years are no longer independent, and they should not be viewed as such, because they've probably become too close to management over time. So I threw a lot of spaghetti on the wall. I know none of it probably sticks. But corporate governance does matter in the REIT space and why we have. This is one of the few sectors in the S&P 500 where you can ascertain what the value of a company is, plus or minus 5 10%. You, our semiconductor analyst has no freaking idea what NVIDIA is worth ascertain because of a private semiconductor business. So there isn't this back and forth that goes of the arbitrage that you see. I have no issue at all with privatizations because I firmly believe after when people start making money, investment bankers and companies will come public again. So there's this accordion effect of the size of the REIT market. And right now, I actually think it probably should shrink before it can grow again. I'll emphasize one thing. Corporate governance doesn't matter until it matters. And when it matters, it's all that matters. And that's, that's the way to think about Corp Gov and the read space. And so you have to be ready for it, basically. Um, I'm going to try not to say I agree with a lot of what Steve said, but I do, um, because there is a lot of alignment of interest here between what the shareholders want and what management and boards should deliver. 
Yeah, and at the end of the day, a lot of this is about uh, the performance on behalf of the shareholders. You never need to forget that. Board members are the representative of the shareholders, and they should play that function well. If they don't, activism should always be a part of the equation. So we are very comfortable with activism. I think it's an important part of creating a proper path of communication also sometimes with the board. The point about uh, who's on the board, what's their motivation is important. It's very hard to ascertain though. So the, the one thing that we hear a lot from board members is you'd be surprised who really adds value and who doesn't within the boardroom. Things I, that I've we done, don't see from the outside. I've done in my career 30 board presentations and I'm constantly mm -hmm. amazed as I walk away from those meetings how little the, a lot of the board members know about the company they're a board member of. I and think, that's a sad statement. I, I think the biggest issue is education, which is what you pointed out. Uh, I think board members should be fed a significant amount of information about the company and competitors uh, from outside parties. And that's not a shameless plug for Green Street. It's just you, they should be receiving a lot of research. <laughs> and subscribing. <laughs> All right. In defense if, of REIT board members, um, I would like to point out that uh, <laughs> we have seen unprecedented CEO turnover in the last few years. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen quite a bit of board turnover. And so people are getting the message. I mean, I don't, yep. this is not how it was 30 years ago. Um, and, you know, and even to, to, to the 10 year point, honestly, um, in many cases, the, you know, you might think that person who's been there for 10 years is wedded to management, but management isn't, hasn't been there for 10 years or, or you know, what have you. So I, I, do, I do think that, um, I do think things are improving, um, but I think these are I think these are really good questions to ask. Um, but um, you know, I also just want to remind you guys that you know, the board members know that they are individually accountable for for all of this, and um, you know, good companies are not just doing things to support their friend who's the CEO. I, I would say that the REIT industry is particularly well managed, and we need to take that step back often and think through it. If you think through the spectrum of real estate companies broadly. The, the public real estate companies are uniquely well managed as a group, but we compare them with each other. So there will always be some where we say something is not quite right today. Right. But, but, but it is interesting how many people from the buy side and sell side now work at REITs or on REIT boards because does that mean that job's easier on a risk adjusted basis than our job? Because our jobs are really hard. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think that um, what, one of my lessons from being on the outside and being on the inside is all those ideas I had about buy this, sell that, um, you know, uh, and, and then everything will be fine. It's literally impossible to execute because of tax or whatnot and just how long things take. But, um, but I want to take the temperature down a little bit and I'm going to talk about <laughs> uh, fund flows in the public and private market and what it's meant for revaluation. So, uh, Nick. I think Nick came with some stats. Sure, so I brought, uh, brought a few numbers. So fund flows are obviously very important. Um, we publish weekly on what we see in terms of uh, dedicated ETFs, mutual funds, and we also track uh, the money that comes in from Japan through mutual funds there. It used to be about almost 10% of the index. It's, it's really shrunk to about three or 4%, but we keep an eye on it anyway. Um, the good news, I guess, uh, maybe relatively good news, is uh, flows year to date have been flat. So basically no inflows, no outflows. Maybe that doesn't sound like good news. Um, it's a week old, so we'll see what happens in the next few weeks, obviously, with what's happened with rates. Um, but in eight of the nine previous years, we saw pretty meaningful outflows. 2021 was the one exception where we saw inflows. And just to give you an idea, last year and in 2022, we saw about 15 billion of outflows each year. Um, and so I think you know, part of that has been growth in other areas uh, across the market. Obviously, the market has done well, uh, particularly you know, over the past few years coming out of COVID. Um, I think part of that is the volatility of interest rates, which we've obviously touched on, so I don't want to repeat there. Um, but what could make that turn? We think, number one, Maybe it is M&A, particularly on the A side. Um, number two, a stability of interest rates. And then number three, ultimately, ideally, lower interest rates. You'd asked on NAV as well. Um, look, NAVs are always an art and a science, I think, to Steve's point. Usually, you can get it uh, pretty well looking at uh, private transaction uh, deals. Unfortunately, the transaction market has been pretty slow relative to what we historically see. So it's a bit more of an art right now. What we typically do is we'll look at 
uh, kind of IRRs of what we expect in the private market. We'll look at current debt costs and we'll assume some kind of spread on top of that, at least for a going in cap rate, because typically investors don't want to buy something with negative leverage to begin with. Uh, we have the public REITs trading at about a 5% discount to our NAVs right now. That obviously moves around with where the stock prices are. Um, but that's the average. The range is much wider. So there's sectors that have a cost of capital advantage trading at premiums. Then there's others that we think are trading at pretty steep discounts. But in general, um, you know, we're slightly below NAV right now, we think. Um, one other thing, uh, one, one other thing that might be a little bit below the radar for, for the audience is um, in February and early March, we saw um, a really unexpected move in the market and um, uh, sort of like an end of day um, unwind. And it happened, it happened several times in a row. And what happened was it turned out three really well-regarded hedge funds, dedicated REIT hedge funds, um, unwound. And um, the impact was, in hindsight, very visible to the market and surprising, I think, relative to the size of, of these funds. Um, Susie, you spent uh, some of your career in the hedge fund world. <laughs> would love your take on that. Sure. Well, I mean, I don't necessarily think, I mean, I don't want to speak to those specific hedge funds and the reasons for their unwind. But when I think about my time um, at Millennium, I mean, albeit it was more than 10 years ago, and so I think the hedge fund environment, the env entire investing environment has changed considerably since then. But I think the two factors that you really need to sort of, you know, hit it out of the park, so to speak, in hedge fund land, if you're running um, a long, short book with fairly, you know, strict risk parameters and not take, you know, sector neutral, is you need good trading liquidity and you need a lot of volatility. Otherwise, if you're pair trading REITs, you can make money, but as I said before, you're, you're not gonna hit it out of the park. And so, when, you know, fast forward to today, I think we actually have those two things in spades, and we've talked a lot on this panel about the volatility, um, but I think that trading liquidity for REITs has actually really improved over the last 10 years, and maybe it's because it, we are our own um, GIX group or you know, we now have you know, more than 20 REITs in the S&P 500, maybe a little bit of like careful what you wish for. I remember when the first REIT was in the S&P 500 and we were all cheering. Um, but so I think you know, with, those, with those two factors in mind, I actually think you know, while we are seeing some closures, I think the road ahead for hedge funds using REITs is actually quite bright. And so I mean, there's always the obviously you know, chance to underperform, but I think those two criteria will actually see more hedge funds using REITs over time. Okay. I think so too. Um, anything to add before? Um, okay, I have some more questions, but I thought I would turn it over to the audience um, to see if anybody had any questions for the group. Given the um, surfeit of data from Fidelity, Citi, Bank of America regarding the great wealth transfer and the surveyed behaviors of most of the millennial investors in this room, why is the preponderance of conversation on public, secure, public REIT securities versus non-traded REITs, especially since one of the speakers who's going to be next is the largest on the planet? Well, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I mean, <laughs> something, something. Oh, it's a sad state of the public REIT market that we've lost market share to non-traded REITs. That's right. And they have, generally speaking, most non-traded REITs have a performance bogey of 5%. Woo, tough in today's cash world. And the long-term Fund, my fund, which is the oldest REIT mutual fund, November 17, 1986, is about 10% annualized return. And it's been a lot lower the last couple of years, I, sad to say. Um, yeah. Product that's sold, not bought. Yeah, and I, th I think the truth of the matter is, is that um, I don't think that, um, that, that, that what this group is investing in and the opportunities we see and the mark to market we need to deal with. Um, I just think it's very different um, than, what you're, than what you would see in the private side. And so it, would, it, it, it could be its own, its own conversation and I, th I think it's gonna be shortly. I would just add the, uh, the push and pull of volatility versus liquidity, right? The public REITs, you're obviously more volatile but you have that liquidity benefit whereas non-traded REITs, for better or worse, you don't have the liquidity, but you don't have the volatility, at least on the stated um, NAV or mark-to-market. Perceived. 
Yeah, let, let me add just, just for a second on that. So there is uh, an entire industry that is uh, pricing real estate assets in the private market that I described last year as driving while looking in a rear view mirror. Um, to say that it's been proven true doesn't do justice to the statement. Uh, the appraisals are woefully, woefully out of date. Over the long term, what you really get is REITs are real estate, and all real estate should perform reasonably in the same fashion, whether it's in the public or in the private market. So then the next question is, what is being owned in those vehicles? Right? Which sectors, which markets? And that's what's gonna make the real difference over time. In the short term, the appraisals completely change the answer, uh, and in a way that distorts it, unfortunately. Over the long term, I think you'll get to the right place in terms of performance, and it's gonna be correlated with the ownership of certain sectors in certain markets. It's not only the appraisals of the asset side, I think the debt side is very different, and the dividend coverage is also very different, just to add to it. That's, that's entirely fair. Thank you. Time for one more. Um, I think it's a time horizon question. Uh, I am very bullish on multifamily broadly. I think there's a structural shortage of housing. I think it's needs-based. I think it's a high NOI and high cash flow margin business. The challenge right now is there's just a good amount of supply, particularly in the Sun Belt. And so depending on the job outlook, thus far it's been pretty good. So you've seen decent absorption, but rent growth has slowed. Um, but I think as you look over the next two to three years, the supply really starts to come off. And assuming a normalized job growth environment, we would think rent growth would inflect, and it's a very good medium and longer term business. It's just a supply question right now. I'm happy to answer off this, or if someone else wants to. I, I, I can. So, so the question was, do any of us see multifamily or office as, as being valuable, as being positive? Um, it, from me, I, I'll give you a bit of a different answer. I, I think. When you look at multifamily, currently it's on a relative basis fair to, to a little bit pricey uh, in the public market. What people are not looking at sometimes is pockets of strength uh, on the private side. And there's a number of markets that we don't think about in the middle of the country that most likely will provide the best returns on multifamily over time. You can't really play those in the public market, but for, from a private market perspective, um, you need to pay attention to Columbus and Pittsburgh and a variety of other markets that people don't spend enough time in. All right, with that, we're at time. Thank you so much. Thanks to my panelists.